And now it's time for December part four. You have six questions for December part four. What happens when gods die? How many days were left? What did he wonder? What did she pull out? What did a hauling get? And what did President Johnson declare? When gods die, they die hard. So that's number one. It's not like they fade away or grow old or fall asleep. They die in fire and pain. And when they come out of you, they leave your guts burned. It hurts more than anything you can talk about. And maybe worst of all, you're not sure if there will ever be another God to fill their place, or if you'd ever want another God to fill their place, because you don't want the fire to go out inside you twice. The Hupfers drove me back to the festival theater. I went in to see if the men's dressing room was finally unlocked. It was, and Mr. Goldman was holding forth. My dainty Ariel, he called, and threw his arms out wide, and the company, the men that is, for the record, all clapped. Where have you been? You, the star of the extravaganza. Something should be wrong? I shook my head. How could you tell Mr. Goldman that the gods had died when they lived so strongly in him? Was it well done? I asked. Bravely, my diligence, thou shalt be free. And I was. I changed and left the yellow tights with the feathers on the butt in the locker, never to be worn again by me. Mr. Goldman told me I should stop by the bakery for some cream puffs, which will cost you not a thing, and I left. That was it. Outside, it was the first really cold night of winter, and the only fire in sight was the stars high above us and far away, glittering like ice. The Hupfers were waiting and drove me home. We still didn't talk, not the whole way. When I got back, my parents were in the den, watching television. It was so cold, the furnace was on high. The hot air tinkled silver bells that decorated the white artificial Christmas tree that never dropped a single pine needle in the perfect house. You're done earlier than I thought, my father said. Bing Crosby's just about to start White Christmas as soon as this commercial's over. How'd it go, Holly? said my mother. Fine. I hope Mr. Goldman was happy with what you did, said my father. He said it was just swell. Good. I went upstairs. The crooning notes of Bing Crosby's treetops glistening and children listening and sleigh bells in the snow followed me. Just swell. Happy holidays. When we got back to school on Monday, there were only three more days before the holiday break. That's number two. They were supposed to be a relaxed three days. Most teachers coasted through them, figuring that no one was going to learn all that much just before vacation. And they had to leave time for holiday parties on the last day and making presents for each other and looking out the window, hoping for the miracle of snow on Long Island. Even the lunches were supposed to have something special to them, like some kind of cake with thick white frosting or pizza that actually had some cheese on it or hamburgers that hadn't been cooked as thin as a record. Maybe something chocolate on the side? But Mrs. Biggio wasn't interested in chocolate these days. It could have been the last holiday on the planet was ever gonna celebrate and you wouldn't have known it from what Mrs. Biggio cooked for Camillo Junior High's lunch. It was something surprise every day, except after the first day it wasn't something surprise anymore because we knew what was coming. It was just something. But I didn't complain. I remembered the Wednesday afternoon Mrs. Biggio had come into Mrs. Baker's classroom and the sound of her sadness, and I knew what burned guts felt like. Everybody else didn't complain because they were afraid to. You don't complain when Mrs. Biggio stares at you as you're going through the lunch line with her hands on her hips and her hairnet pulled tight. You don't complain. Not even when she spreads around her own happy holiday greetings. Take it and eat it, she said to Danny Hupfer when his hand hesitated over the something. You're not supposed to examine it, she said to Marilee, who was trying to figure out the surprise part. You waiting for another cream puff, she said to me. Don't count on it this millennium. And on the last day before the holiday break, she said to my Thee, pick it up and be glad you're getting it. You shouldn't even be here, sitting like a queen in a refugee home while American boys are sitting in swamps on Christmas Day. 
They're the ones who should be here, not you. Maithi took her something. She looked down and kept going. She probably didn't see that Mrs. Biggio was pulling her hairnet down lower over her face because she was crying. And probably Mrs. Biggio didn't see that my thee was crying too. But I did. I saw them. And I wondered how many gods were dying in both of them right then. That's number three. You'd think that Mrs. Baker would try to make up for the holiday disappointments of the Camillo Junior High Kitchen over these last three days. But she didn't. We went back to diagramming sentences, focusing on the imperfect tenses. She convinced Mr. Samowitz to start some pre-algebra equations in mathematics for you and me that even Albert Einstein couldn't have figured out. She even bullied Mr. Petrelli into buckling down and making us present our Mississippi River to you and, f and you projects out loud for the rest of the class. Mr. Petrelli had us finish in a day and a half, but Mrs. Baker didn't let up for those full three days. We were the only class in Camillo Junior High who sweated behind a closed, decorationless door in a hot, decorationless room. And did we complain? No, because at the first hint of a complaint, Mrs. Baker folded her arms across her chest and stood still, staring at whoever had started to rebel until all rebellion died. That's how it was as we came up to the happy holidays, all the way until the last Wednesday afternoon. As everyone got ready to leave for Temple Beth El or St. Adelbert's, I figured I'd probably be diagramming sentences for the next hour and a half, since we hadn't started another Shakespeare play yet. So just swell. But I was wrong. Mr. Hupfer and Mr. Swiatek, said Mrs. Baker, I've arranged with your parents for you to stay in school this afternoon. Danny and Doug looked at me, then at each other, then back at Mrs. Baker. Okay by me, Danny said. Oh, I'm so pleased to have your approval, said Mrs. Baker. Now the rest of you. And there was the usual hubbub of leaving while Danny and Doug sat back at their desks. What's it about, Danny asked. I shrugged. Erasers, sentence diagramming? Maybe Shakespeare, I said. We, book, we both looked over at Doug Switek. You didn't do number 166, did you? He shook his head. Are you sure, said Danny. Don't you think I know, said Doug Switek. We weren't so sure, but actually he hadn't. All right, so the next video will have the rest of December part four.